now I would like to invite Jim Balistrieri. Jim is our writer in residence at the Clark Hewlings Estate, and he is working on a new book about Clark. Hello. Welcome, <clears throat> Sorry Jim. about my voice, folks. It's not, not the greatest, but I'll fight through it. Thank Go you. ahead. Thank you so much, Jim. Sure. Well, just to, just to start large, here is a question for you. <laughs> How do you write a book about an artist? <laughs> is that large enough for you as a question? Well, no, that's a good that's a good question. And if you think about it, there are, there are lots of books about artists, but maybe only three or four ways that they're generally written. <clears throat> and one is going back to you know Vasari and the lives of the artists, and it's really about the artist's life, and that's one way. And and the next way is really sort of the the artist as an artist where the art sort of dominates the life <clears throat> and you and you tend to see those sort of the the, the pathologies of uh, uh someone like van gogh or uh in, in america blakelock somebody who is sort of driven insane by his art mm -hmm. um, and then in the monograph the art really comes to the fore and and it's really about how <clears throat> the art drives the life um, and, and that's, that is the, the sort of traditional thing. <clears throat> As I've been thinking about working on, on the, the Hewlings book and, and talking to you, I've really been more interested in something that is thematic. Uh, and part, that's in part because Hewlings' art has so many parts. Um, there are so many parts to his career <clears throat> and so many themes within those parts. And he really has, as you read his letters, and get into him and get into his practice, <clears throat> a kind of kaleidoscopic way of, of looking at art, mm -hmm. um, a mosaic. He refers to mosaics, to stained glass. Um, and there's a sense of, of a, a kind of web, different strands of his art going in different directions. And if you look at that, <clears throat> that screen with the, the themes on it, um, you can sort of see what I've been trying to do <clears throat> is that early on paying some attention to biography, but then really going into what what drove him, what moved him, and and you know not being afraid to kind of go down some different roads um, with him. So you and can see it's it's sort of uh, the beginnings and his travels and his practice, and then really. <clears throat> his subjects, his themes, his approaches, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Jim, you know, when you were describing your approach earlier, um, you used the phrase quantum realism. <clears throat> yeah. Speaking of large topics, can you tell us like just, I know we're going to look at some specific paintings together here and maybe it will come up there. Can you tell us what you're thinking when you're sure. thinking? When you look at a Hewlings painting, and, and, and as I've learned from Elizabeth and from Jack and all of you, you're looking at a composite. You're looking at a, a work that is comprised of the photographs he took, of the drawings he did, of, you know, instances where he's not afraid to combine pieces of a village from, from one country or a sky from a different place. And so as I began to think about that and really look at, at his work, um, I began to see that if you think about the physics of an event, the quantum physics, where if you start, and let's do it in terms of art, you start with the impulse to paint a painting as A, and all the different ways that it could get to a final painting, it could be realized. Um, and the, the myriad of choices that an artist makes and that an artist like Hewlings really makes um, to get to that B, that, that, that painting. <clears throat> What's interesting about Hewlings is that you seem to see many, if not all of those possibilities inherent in the final work. You, you sort of feel that this isn't, this isn't an image of a particular moment in time. This is, a, this is an image of this place, almost a portrait of a place in time over time. Uh-huh. 
if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah, I you, you brought up a good one right away. <clears throat> one of my favorite paintings of his, the Mexican Rosary Man. So it, you have, and, and I'll just, I'll run through it. Yeah. You have, uh, this is, you know, near a cathedral, just outside a cathedral wall, which you don't know, but you know that there's a monumental building there. And this man is <clears throat> selling rosaries and other kinds of things, but his tarp is attached to a fragment of a mixed tech column. And so you have the, the present, you have the more recent, you know, the Spanish past, and you have the distant past. <clears throat> and then you have everything, this tarp, right, stretched out and it's attached to this one rock at the, at the, you know, in the painting on the plaza. And so in this singular moment, there's a whole history. And then if you look at how he did this painting, <clears throat> it's almost sepia. It's almost like it's a fading photograph, an old photograph, an antique photograph. So there's so many things going on in, in this one work um, that, that you, you, you sort of feel all of that at once. Yeah, actually, Jim, when you said that, I was just thinking of my philosophy professor who back in the day said to me, this is not for tourists. And this work is not for tourists because it's serious. But I also, I think with the layering of all those different times, it, this is not for tourists. It's much, much richer time story than just nostalgia. Exactly. And it's right. And, and, and I would say, one of the things about Hewling that Hewling's that separates him from other easel paintings of his own era is that it, the, his work is not nostalgic. Um, it, it, he presents laborers, the working poor, uh, farmers going through their daily lives, but there's no sense of judgment. He's not trying to prettify them or <clears throat> give the, give them airs or give us airs. They yeah. just are. And, and, and they're almost, it's interesting because if you look at his figures, they're quite indifferent to us. Um, and you can see that in, in the melon stand, they're quite indifferent. They're going about their lives. And that is, that is very unusual when you compare him to other painters uh, of, of his time. You might find some comparison with, say, Andrew Wyeth. Um, and I think as we talk about repositioning Hewlings, Wyeth is, is a key figure because, because Wyeth, too, sort of tries to take narrative out of some of his work and to let it just be. Uh, and that's, that's very important. Yeah, and that's, I feel like, We'll have to save some of that for another time when we have lots more time. But I, I think all of us at the Healings Estate are interested in this whole idea of the missing chapter of realism <laughs> in 20th century art and why Wyeth snuck in the door. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we can uh, we can talk about that maybe if we have a little more time. But we can um, go on and on, yeah. Let's uh, let's go to wash day. Right. So wash day is is really interesting because the. the the scene in the in the foreground is Cuernavaca, Mexico, but the adobe in the back is Santa Fe, um, and so Hewlings is you know we, we can talk about realism, but but Clark Hewlings is 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 because of his sort of quantum sense of realism is is really not afraid to combine things. He's trying to create you know the best picture. The, the best the, the best representation of of this idea and so it's it's a realism it's also kind of grounded in idealism it, it, he's he's not afraid to to do whatever it takes um, um, to to make the picture what it is and it goes back if you look at um, uh, street in Naples which is I think one of his great great paintings and I know from talking to Elizabeth that he took pictures of this place forever and, and you know, worked at this, worked at this, worked at this. But it's, it's, it's fascinating because if you look at it, right, 
here are the things that are not nostalgic. The, the most important of which is look at the boats. The boats are motor boats. They're not sailboats. If you, if you really dig into the picture, you can see how the people are dressed in modern dress. So there's always this pulling together of what is you know, seemingly timeless and what is of the moment um, with him, which I think is, is sort of a key, key aspect of his work. And it, you know, and his, you know, he's a, a working artist and he saw himself as that. And that's sort of a theme of what we're talking about tonight. Um, but he's a working artist whose subject was work and labor yes. and you know what it took to build a town like that, what it took to what it takes to maintain it, what it takes to be a fisherman there, what it takes to do wash in a river. You know, so that that's really his his subject, and and it's his life, and it's why the the burrow and the donkey are such important, you know, pieces of his puzzle. You know, um, this is a great painting to bring it back to his own work and how hard he would, how far he would go to get what he wanted, right? Because exactly, he stood on this rock. We left my mother up the swim, so I think she's on this. So. Guess what? Here's a story for you. We left her like um, up in the salamander colored buildings because she's tired of traipsing around. And I went on with him and we went all the way down and he crawled out on, on the rock in order to get these photos. And the tide was coming in and my mother's waiting. And so I'm yelling, come on, come on. And the tide came in to the point where I had to get somebody to get in one of those boats and go and rescue him because he was trapped on the rock. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> he got gosh. a shot, right? He got like a hundred photographs of that. And I think we spent three days there and he got it from every angle, every kind of light, every, you know, over and over. And then to, as, as both Jim and Jack were saying, he then created his own composite of it um, to get his point across the way he wanted. Right, right. And you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because what happens is the world of illustration that he comes from becomes this impulse to illuminate. It becomes illumination. And that's why to me, his works are always, there's always lots of light in his works. Not because he's not trying to, he's not trying to create mood. He's trying to show you what these people are like, how they live. And, and what's interesting to me is his, his, his emphasis on shadows, the people casting their own shadows, the buildings casting their own shadows. The, the shadows are like, I look at them and I'm like, you could almost tell time by the shadows they cast. You know, they're, they're, they're like sundials for these sort of rhythms of, of life in places that don't get a lot of attention. Yeah, and always, and and I think that's that's the that's the transition is that illustration to illumination for him. That's beautiful, J Jim. You know, it's funny. I, I've heard a lot about the development of this book, and all of a sudden, I'm newly excited about it. Like it, <laughs> it's just so exciting to hear you talk through these ideas. And uh, for people on the call who are interested in knowing more, we'll be giving you more updates on what Jim is writing about and how you can get involved in the book because. We have a big community around it and we'd love you to be part of it. Well, I'll tell you that the next thing I'm working on with some of the people who knew Clark when Clark was studying with Frank Riley is that whole illustration world in the 50s, which is a whole other story and really an interesting story. So that's coming up. 